Welcome to the Leadership for Innovation Week 8 presentation on fostering innovation and change. Presenting today will be Michael Parker, Jackie Newman, Gail Nitareka, and myself, Rodney Lunt. What we aim to prove throughout a presentation is that the path to fostering organisational innovation is made up of many parts, parts that feed each other and are ultimately tied together by the topic of self-innovation. I'll be discussing diversity in organisations and how it can affect business outcomes. Followed by Michael, demonstrating that you can then access that diversity through the altering of the politics within an organisation to have information flow upwards. Then Jackie will discuss how emotional quotient, EQ, and self-awareness will enable the leader to best utilise the information garnered from the team. Which will lead us to tie the theme together, with Gail discussing how self-innovation feeds organisational innovation. What does diversity mean in the context of leadership behaviours and approaches? I'm Rodney Lunt. And I'll be discussing our first topic, leading innovation through diversity. What is diversity? If we begin with the definition provided by Miriam Webster, the definition of diversity is the condition of having or being composed of differing elements. What does this look like in an organizational context? It could be the individual's background, their life and employment experiences, their education, including difference of disciplines, mix of genders, and lastly, but not limited to the particular individual's specialization. This list is not exhaustive, merely demonstrative of what might make up diversity in an organizational group. So why do we need diversity? Jane and Dipboy suggest that in organizational areas that require creativity, Flexibility and diversity are the most likely ingredients to enhance innovative outcomes. If we are to foster diversity in our organisations, we need to foster a culture where there is difference of thought, difference of backgrounds and experiences in life. This enables us to tap into a wide range of knowledge and thinking, therefore enabling innovation to occur. From a commercial perspective, the 2019 survey reported that organisations with revenue areas tied to innovation reported a 19% improvement over organisations with below average diversity rates. A series of interviews conducted by Steber and Alang discussed that a key element of Google's success in the area of innovation was due to actively hiring for diversity. This leads us to the first leadership behaviour, eliminating bias. As a leader, if we are to hire for diversity, we need to ensure we do not approach the hiring process applying our personal biases. If we can identify and acknowledge our biases, then we can correct for that during our decision making or put in place mechanics to ensure our decision making is independently assessed, perhaps by a peer or advocate. Secondly, Google identifies specific areas of diversity that promote innovation in their teams. Some of those are background, competencies, expectations, emotions. As a leadership behavior, identifying specific diversity traits and hiring for them would enhance the creativity of thinking in your teams and will result in enhanced innovation. As an example, if you are engineering a product and brought on an artist, an ergonomics expert and a mix of genders, the realized product would be more likely to appeal to a mix of end users and also take into account things like comfortability of use, aesthetics and potentially different ways to use the product. Should this be left only to engineers, then those other aspects may be missed in pursuit of practicality. Thirdly, Stephen Lang noted that Google also ensured they had a support process in place to foster and nurture talent in the organization. As a leader, it is important that one engages in direct feedback with teams. By engaging and supporting individual talent by coaching and clearly communicating expectations, the individual can be encouraged to innovate in a supportive and safe environment. Where uncertainty reigns, innovation is stifled within an organization. How was it measured? It's important to understand that diversity begins at the front door as per Google's example. In order to identify if our behavior and decision making is providing for diversity appropriately, it's important that we assess the process in aggregate. Van Babel and West discuss, for instance, 
If 50% of job applicants are women and no women progress to the final interview stage, the suggestion would be that bias is being introduced earlier in the process. What is possible is for the leader to use the aggregate results to assess for bias and use that learning to address those biases in the process moving forward. Next up, we have Michael Parker to discuss politics and innovation. Thanks, Michael. Organisational democracy is the politics to innovate, or the politics that will stimulate innovation. When we think of politics, we think of who's in power or who has the power. Question, power for what? Hello, my name is Michael Parker, and in the next few minutes, I will take you on a journey to destination innovation. I will present organisational democracy, the power politics that fuels innovation. In many workplaces today, managers view their role from a traditional viewpoint. In other words, they tell their workers how to do things, when to do things, and how fast they should do those things. And through experience, workers know that they need to do it the manager's way. And often workers become conditioned to the manager's position. Often the workers do things with little or no questions asked. They become disengaged. They don't need to think of better ways or easier ways of doing things. They don't question the why and the what. And this lack of engagement is multiplied because not only is the individual not completely given to their role, but the whole workforce is not being used to find innovation. New ways, new ideas, new solutions to problems. The workforce sacrifices opportunities to innovate and it's often left to the leaders only. Ricardo Sembler once said, we'll send our sons anywhere in the world to die for democracy, but we don't seem to apply the concept to the workplace. So like any good MBA student, I started to do my research on Ricardo Sembler. Hey Google, who's Ricardo Semler? According to Wikipedia, Ricardo Semler is the CEO and majority owner of Semco Partners, a Brazilian company best known for its radical form of industrial democracy and corporate re-engineering. So Google says that Semler was best known for his radical form of industrial democracy. Radical. What did Semler do that was so radical? What did he achieve? Sembler took his father's business, Semco, as a young man, and through a process, he innovated his own leadership style. And through that innovation, he brought innovation to the whole organization. So now the activity of innovation was something that the whole organization did, not just the department within the organization. Semler took outdated modes of operation, and he gave frontline workers the power to make their own decisions. Power to choose their own direction. The power to choose the way they did their own job. The power to innovate processes. The power to produce solutions and innovative products. He listened. Samler listened. The organization listened to its employees. He trusted his workers' expertise. He trusted his own decision to hire who he did. He gave them the power to choose where they worked, when they worked, how much they worked, and how much they got paid. His workers were able to have a better work-life mix, and they were more productive at work, more creative at work. They had a freedom to participate. They were more engaged in their work. They spent the time on what mattered to them, their family, or the things they always wanted to do but didn't have the time to do it. He gave them the power to choose their own manager, the power to fire their own manager. When Ricardo Semler took over the business in 1982 from his father, the annual revenue was just under $4 million. As a direct response to his innovative management policies, Ricardo Semler took this business to over $212 million some 20 years later. 
He did it by giving the control to the workers. He empowered them to be innovators within their own roles, and he enabled them to be enablers of change. Albert Einstein once said, creativity is intelligence having fun. And if organizations need creative innovations, then workplaces need to have the atmosphere or the politics that fosters creativity and therefore innovation. And now to Jackie Newman on the topic EQ, the role of self-awareness in leading innovation. Thanks, Jackie. Emotional quotient, the role of self-awareness in leading innovation. Do leaders with high self-awareness drive innovation? Or do leaders with low self-awareness suppress innovation in the workplace? Hello, my name is Jackie Newman, and I'm about to show you how leaders and self-awareness has an impact in workplace innovation. It is widely documented the impact emotional quotient or EQ has on leading innovation and change. But to take innovation leadership to the next level, a leader must have high self-awareness. As John Boynton writes, self-awareness is our own unique ability to understand our individual tendencies, perceive our emotional state and proceed to behave in certain ways. Let's look at an example. Ben is a rising star. He is promoted by his boss's boss. Once in the new position, Ben disagrees with his boss's sales projections and he has to navigate a tricky set of interests and relationships. Ben makes mistakes along the way, including publicly criticizing his supervisor's numbers and failing to build the needed alliances within the organization. In the end, Ben sacrifices his long-term career possibilities at the company for short-term wins. We can learn a lot from cases like Ben's. Ben clearly didn't read or interpret the situation he was in at the time. Some would say he lacked self-awareness. The most effective leaders have the ability to stay open to new information and experiences while also demonstrating strengths such as empathy, inquiry and emotional regulation. But why is this important in leading innovation? For a leader to be truly effective in leading innovative creativity and behaviours, they must first understand their own tendencies and behaviours. This will then allow them to be able to influence the actions of others. As you can see in this awareness wheel, self-awareness comes in many different forms, such as feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. According to Leslie Brokaw, a survey of 75 members of the Stanford Graduate School of Business Advisory Council rated self-awareness as the most important capability for leaders to develop. Executives need to know where their natural inclinations lie in order to boost them or compensate for them. Self-awareness is about identifying personal idiosyncrasies, the characteristics that executives take to be the norm but actually represent the exception. But what can happen if a leader doesn't have self-awareness? Leaders who lack self-awareness tend to be unaware of how their decisions and behaviour impact the people working for them. A lack of self-awareness can result in behaviour that is perceived as bullying or inconsistent. They can have a detrimental impact and suppress innovative ideas, and they can also be seen as ineffective leaders. In summary, developing emotional self-awareness is a crucial first step in effective leadership because it lays the foundation upon which emotional and social intelligence is built. We can't develop skills like emotional self-control, empathy or teamwork unless we are aware of our own feelings and how they influence our thoughts and behaviours. Emotional self-awareness can also help leaders link their intention and emotions to the effectiveness of their interactions with others, thus leading to the ability for innovation to flourish. Thank you. I will now hand over to Gail, who will take you through innovative leaders and self-innovation. The world's most innovative companies are being led by the world's most innovative leaders. Think SpaceX and Elon Musk. Research tells us that these leaders are inherently innovative. 
that we can all learn to be innovative. Hi, my name is Gael. Float with me as we explore how we can achieve this. An article published by Harvard Business Review titled The Innovator's DNA found five discovery skills that the most innovative leaders shared in common. These set of skills can all be learned and, like a craft, practiced until they become part of us. The first one is associational thinking. It is about connecting ideas that are unconnected as we seek novelty. Think about a time you have used a tool or a product designed for one thing and used it for something else in order to solve a problem or simply create novelty. Artists do this often, for example, putting leaves onto a canvas instead of simply painting one. By learning to play around with different ideas, we can teach our brains to link various thoughts and ideas to others. The second skill is observing. Intentionally paying attention and being aware of our surrounding and actively listening. In essence, it's mindful meditation. This skill teaches us to notice details and allows, us, allows the mind to discover. When was the last time you practiced mindfulness? Today there are numerous apps for mindful meditation. Why don't you download one and give it a 10 minute try? You'll soon realize it is a skill that requires practice. The third skill is experimenting. Experimenting doesn't always have to be an external thing we do. In fact, the concept of adaptive authentic leadership requires experimenting with different versions of ourselves. Take a scientific approach and try it out. Change your routine for a week or how you talk to your peers or even your dress style and observe your feelings and the responses from your peers. Make sure you record it. Experimenting helps us identify the strengths and weaknesses that are conditional to fostering innovation. The fourth skill is questioning. Have you taken the time to question your values, aspiration, and the lessons learned from your past experiences? This type of questioning is a powerful tool for reframing challenges in our lives. It teaches us to be vulnerable, projecting us towards discovering our authentic selves. Questioning requires us to step back in order to grow. The fifth and final one is networking, not in the context of work or career progression, but in our personal lives. How many friends do you catch up with on a regular basis that have radically different views to your own? In most cases, our friends are pretty similar to us, but there is a value in having friends that are different, that have different views and lifestyles to us. They bring different perspectives in our lives. See it as trying on other people's eyes, just like you would with glasses. The more we practice this, the more we teach ourselves to accept perspectives outside ours. We can teach ourselves to switch off our default setting of autopilot, observing and questioning our life patterns and working on a plan to reprogram. Through intentional practice, we force the will and action to innovate ourselves. Thanks, Gail. In conclusion, we can see that these elements discussed of diversity, politics, EQ self-awareness, and self-innovation all provide the grounding for fostering innovation in an organization. We've provided evidence to demonstrate the importance of diversity to then be enhanced by the right political structure, which can then again be enhanced by leaders with developed EQ skills. And finally, by recognizing that if we as leaders do not self-innovate, then we cannot foster an environment where innovation can flourish. Please join our discussion and contribute, and we will see you on the discussion boards. References to follow. Thank you.